The Modern Acre. Agriculture for the next generation farm and business. The Modern Acre is a community of students, farmers, professionals, and entrepreneurs passionate about building their ag businesses through modern day innovation and technology. If you're in the ag industry and looking for strategies for your business and inspiration from industry leaders and disruptors, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join the community of ag innovators at themodernacre.co. Hey guys, you're listening to episode 98 of The Modern Acre. So happy New Year's Eve. Uh, This is coming out again on a holiday. I got Tim working on a holiday, Um, but hope you guys enjoyed Christmas and are looking forward to the new year. I know Tim and I are super excited for it, but I'm sure before we get into anything, I'm sure everyone is just on pins and needles to hear how our holiday party went. We went to the Sacramento Kings game and they did lose, but it was it was quite a fun night. Yeah, if you guys think Tyler is intense on the podcast, you should see him at a Kings game. He was standing up about half the game, like throwing his fists in the air. It was intense. Yeah, we threw some uh, some stories out on Instagram that I think pretty, pretty accurately depicted uh, Tim and I's personalities. <laughs> Had a lot of fun, brought our wives. It's definitely going to be an annual thing. For sure, definitely going to be an annual thing. Tyler and I both love watching Bay Area sports. We were deep into the 49ers game last night and glad we came away with the victory. That put us at the top of the NFC. We're the number one seed. And needless to say, Tim and I were pretty pumped. And following our, you know, such a successful holiday party, we just figured we had to, you know, get 2020 started off right with a company retreat. So we had an impulse buy of some Niners playoff tickets. (laughs) Our wives hate us right now. Saying it out loud is a <laughs> is a little <laughs> embarrassing, but we're actually really excited. It'll be my first playoff game, so I'm I'm pretty pumped. Yeah, I've never been to a playoff game in any professional sport, so this will be a good one for us. Holiday party right into company retreat. I think it makes total sense. It makes total sense. Well, guys, as we enter into 2020, um, we've alluded to on the podcast before that we're going to be doing a major rebrand of the Modern Acre uh, for our 100th episode. So we're super excited about it. Hope you guys just enjoy enjoy the changes. We're going to be updating our website, um, our logo, etc. cetera. Um, so that'll be on the 100th episode, debuting all of that. But... Right now, you can go on any of our social channels, and that would include Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, and our logos are updated with kind of a sneak peek of our logo. So we're excited. So if you guys want to check that out, go follow us on those on those social media channels. Yeah, we're super excited about how it came out and looking forward to, to sharing it all with you guys in a couple of weeks. Totally. So be sure to check those out, guys. And then in addition, before we air the 100th episode, we are going to give an early preview to all of our, our newsletter subscribers. So any, anyone who subscribes to Acre Insights, um, we're going to be sending out a newsletter in advance of the episode and giving you showing you the whole updated brand, logo, podcast artwork, and we'll kind of give some background about why and how we made these changes. So if you want to see it early, which I know you guys are all itching to, be sure to subscribe. Every few weeks, Tim and I are sharing kind of our insights on the industry and what, what's happening. So definitely encourage you guys to check it out. You can go to themodernacre.com slash insights and sign up there. So this week on the podcast, we have a really exciting guest, Richard Owen from PMA. Richard is the vice president of global membership and engagement. I've known Richard for several years and I've um, been with him on some of the international events that PMA puts on. So um, was really good to sit down and talk with him and recap the past several years of trade events that have happened and look ahead to, to what's on the docket for 2020 and um, just kind of the perspective that he brings from a, from a trade perspective to our industry is super insightful. Totally. This was a fun format we did with Richard, and he's so knowledgeable and kind of lays it out in a very practical and digestible way. Uh, so, you know, this is a, a meteor topic, global trade, but this is a, a great episode to kind of understand what's happened this past year and look forward to 2020. So I encourage you guys to listen. Hope you enjoy it. Hi, Richard. Welcome to the show. Great. Thanks. It's good to be here. 
We're excited to talk to you and learn more about your perspective on global trade. So maybe we'll actually start there. You were you were talking about the pace of change in in the industry as it relates to to the U.S. Maybe talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, Tim and Tyler, as we close out 2019, one of the things that I've been thinking about in the last few months is um, how much change has occurred within the world. Uh, only about 3% of the world's population resides in the U.S., and, and I see particularly outside the borders of the U.S. Uh, change really picking up. It's not just technology, uh, but it's about um, information moving back and forth quickly. And I think as we move into 2020, it'll be very interesting to see um, how the U.S. keeps up uh, with the the pace of change in terms of technology, in terms of trade policy, which is the area we're going to be speaking about today, um, and just in in terms of uh, making progress in the world. And I think that's uh, uh, something that um, I, I don't take um, for granted, the fact that uh, there is a, a much larger uh, playing field uh, than just the United States. And uh, all of us need to acknowledge that, whether you uh, sell directly into global markets or whether um, you uh, seem to be uh, removed a step or two from them. Yeah, we're really excited to dig into that. And I think you bring a, a really unique window and perspective, kind of bridging the gap, especially with PMA, kind of bringing the international community and looking at looking at the, the trade through that lens. But kind of before we go there, maybe talk a little bit about where you grew up and how you got into the agriculture industry. Well, agriculture for me, uh, like uh, probably some of your other guests, uh, comes naturally. I grew up in southwest Virginia, uh, not too far from the North Carolina border in what we call the Blue Ridge Mountains. Uh, didn't grow up on a farm, but my grandfather had a farm across uh, the street or across the road from us, um, and I worked on that quite a bit. Um, and I was also very actively involved in agriculture in high school, very active in FFA. I was a state officer. I was a national FFA officer candidate. Uh, and that was really the exposure to the agriculture world. Um, that I had. My degree is in agriculture from Virginia Tech, uh, so I continued um, uh, the field uh, on through my university studies. And I guess the trends for me as I look at my career, there are really two things that's, that stand out that I've been pretty consistent with. Number one is, um, with exception of uh, probably a two or three year stint, I've worked in agriculture uh, my entire career. And the other thing that I really fell in love with fairly quickly was working with board of directors and working with volunteer groups. And uh, so that set my pace in working for associations the majority of my career. So um, agriculture for me runs very deep. Um, it, it runs in uh, a variety of different parts of agriculture, from animal agriculture to the grain industry. Uh, lived and worked in Montana for eight years. Um, and then obviously in the produce uh, industry for the past 10 years. And again, the thing that's probably consistent through all of those agriculture realms is working for or with some type of associations that represent um, growers or other parts of the industry within agriculture. No, that's an impressive background. And you've obviously covered a wide range of the ag industry. Um, Richard, maybe talk about your current role with PMA uh, before we kind of jump into global trade. Sure. My, my uh, current role within PMA is uh, working within the membership team, and um, it's, it's kind of a blended position. I am about 30 percent or about a third of my time is per, spent working on global trade policy issues like the ones um, that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. And the remainder of my time is spent working with um, our members and volunteer groups uh, across the globe in different aspects. One of the things um, that I think I bring unique to this position on global trade is um, I had a chance myself to be um, employed as an agricultural trade negotiator for the U.S. government. And the agency in the U.S. that does trade negotiations is called the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. Um, and I think that really fueled my interest in trade policy and the fast moving world and how much impact that has uh, on trade in a variety of different ways. So. Um, it's something that I uh, enjoy. I think I do bring value to our members. And I, I um, want to think that one of my key roles is to educate our members uh, and the broader industry on um, trade policy and how it does impact uh, the fresh produce industry day in and day out. 
That's really exciting stuff. And I love what PMA has done in recent years to deliver that further value to its members and beyond just assisting them with the marketing efforts of tapping into these other areas, especially global trade and giving them them insight there. So um, yeah, let me, maybe let's dive in. And if you could give us a recap of kind of the major events that happened this year from a trade perspective. I've been involved in global trade, uh, whether it's policy or, or working directly with um, global companies for about 20 years. And I would say that 2019 was the most active and as well the most um, to some degree, unpredictable year in trade policy that I've ever experienced. Um, and they run all the way from the ongoing effort to um, introduce and, and hopefully finally pass the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, which replaces NAFTA. Um, also related to Mexico uh, was um, threats by President uh, Trump to close the Mexican border in late May and early June, uh, which would have obviously been very um, impactful to not just the U.S. market, but also the Canadian market. A lot of product moves from, from Mexico into, into Canada through the U.S. as well. Uh, clearly, um, uh, lots of ongoing discussion, discussions and maybe even you could say um, battles with China over tariffs. And we saw tariffs on both sides, both China and the U.S. side, ratchet up throughout the year, um, impacting uh, fresh produce, some direct, we'll talk a little bit more about that, some commodities within fresh produce more than others. Um, you have the ongoing issue of Brexit, which is the UK leaving the European Union and a lot of the uncertainties that relate to that. But one of the things that we uh, certainly know is that um, if Brexit is on the path that it's currently on, which is um, to take place uh, sometime in 2020, then there will be negotiations for trade agreements by country to country, say the U.S. to to the U.K., and that should bring opportunities for um, the U.S. industry. And one of the things um, I'd like to bring up as well is while the TPP, which is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, the U.S. pulled out of that last year. It was one of the, excuse me, all the way back to 2017. It was one of the first decisions that President Trump made the other 11 countries that negotiated that agreement have moved forward with creating uh, what they've now called um, uh, the CPP, CPTPP, um, and uh, most of the countries have ratified that. So those that agreement is in place, and to some degree, the U.S. is left out of being able to take part in, uh, you know, over 10 percent of the world's uh, GDP by not being a part of that agreement. So that's something that's occurred outside the U.S. borders, but it's certainly impacting the U.S. Thanks for that recap. I mean, I think that's super helpful. You you said it was an unpredictable year, which I think uh, most most of our listeners would would agree from from the trade standpoint. I think it'd be helpful. You know, a lot of us have heard these things. We know about the trade wars going on. How is this impacting the producers and the farmers that that you deal with? How how can they you know mitigate risk in this climate? Sure. I'll take a couple of these trade issues um, and break them out a little bit um, separately so we can kind of look at the impact. And let's take the first one I mentioned, which is the USMCA. Um, this is an agreement um, that was basically updated. Uh, it still reflects the zero tariffs, which were in place from NAFTA before, uh, but it really um, has brought uh, 25 years worth of new technology to play in the agreement. So it updates technology, it updates uh, some of the border crossing protocols. Um, it also provides a more understandable way to adjudicate trade issues between countries if they come up. Um, this is an agreement um, that the fresh produce industry in general has been supportive of wanting to see um, come into place. There are I need to certainly recognize there are sectors of fresh produce uh, that have benefited from this more than others, uh, just to make sure I uh, give that acknowledgement. But all in all, the fresh produce industry has said um, that having predictable year-round supply of fresh produce um, has increased consumption and at the end of the day fits very much into the PMA strategy or our vision of creating a, a healthier world uh, from the consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, that one did uh, pass the U.S. House of Representatives, that agreement did 
right at the end of 2019. Uh, we're now waiting for the U.S. Senate to take up U.S. MCA early in 2020. And we would like to see um, that certainly on the desk for the president ready to sign as quickly as possible so we can move on uh, to some other uh, other issues. Um, I'll bring up the I'll also mention a little bit more about China tariffs. And this has really been uh, extending back into 2018 when the president uh, made it very clear that he wanted to have uh, to take China to task for what he felt was some unfair uh, practices related to um, to currency manipulation, uh, in his words, uh, to also uh, unfair treatment of intellectual property and some other issues. And to deal with that, he increased tariffs um, on certain products. There were back and forth tariff increases uh, on both sides. Um, and some of the biggest impacted commodities in fresh produce were cherries, uh, for example, cherries from Washington and Oregon uh, into China, um, table grapes from California. Uh, apples were impacted to some degree, uh, but some of the commodities like table grapes saw um, um, huge uh, amounts of grapes that would have t traditionally moved into China uh, having to be reabsorbed into other markets. And those are kind of the um, side effects of things that happen when you have trade agreements, excuse me, when you have trade issues that block or put high tariffs on one place, the market has to absorb that product somewhere else. So that is um, some of the some of the um, uh, key issues that uh, came up and how they affected fresh produce. Uh, this one also, in terms of China tariffs, did have some relief at the end of 2019. Uh, there was an increase um, that was threatened to be implemented December 15th. Uh, the president um, uh, agreed to not implement uh, that increased tariff and roll back some of the earlier tariffs a little bit, not really affecting fresh produce that much. Uh, and then in return, Chinese agreed to buy uh, uh, up to $50 billion worth of U.S. agricultural products. We don't know exactly what products it's going to be, um, but there was a commitment from China to do that into 2020. So that's a that's kind of a look at some of the uh, more significant kind of trade issues that came forward in 2019 and how they impacted or could impact in the future fresh produce. Richard, I was wondering if you could maybe give us an update on market access and protocols. Um, any new commodities in the pipeline um, to get access into some new markets for U.S. Uh, growers and producers? If I take the example of China, there have been commodities that have been on the the waiting list to go into the Chinese market. I take uh, blueberries, for example, going into China. Uh, they have been in the in the queue for probably 10 years. Avocados are also on the list to go into China. But those have really gone quiet in the last year, year and a half. Once China and the U.S. ramped up their um, trade uh, skirmishes, that really put a halt on um, the appetite of the Chinese to approve new products coming into the country. Um, so we're hoping to see some of those break through in 2020 as we uh, see some thawing in the in the tariff war between the U.S. and China. Um, but we'll have to see what happens in that. If you look towards Europe, uh, one of the things that we would like to see negotiated with um, uh, with the U.K., perhaps in a new uh, bilateral trade agreement, is um, protocols that allow for um, tolerances on, um, on chemicals, on herbicides going into Europe that have been very restrictive on our products up to this point. So if, you, if you're negotiating with just one country, the, the UK, versus an entire block of countries, the EU, uh, we hope that that gives some relief to the pressure to, do, um, um, to, to negotiate something that's much more beneficial or much more in line with the protocols that uh, we have here in the U.S., Richard, from a trade perspective, what technologies or companies do you see benefiting the industry most right now? Um, technology, so let me take the technology spin first. The technology um, that could benefit the most, and again, it depends on the language that's in trade agreements, is in the space of um, biotechnology or technology more broadly. And biotechnology um, 
has the ability to really change the the characteristics of a fruit or vegetable fruit most likely in the kind of the, the forefront of biotechnology um, to really drive uh, consumer traits uh, varieties that could meet the the needs of consumers in terms of longer shelf life or longer cold storage life moving to the um, uh, place of consumption wherever that may be for the product um, and so some of those, the approvals for those um, technologies uh, to be across the borders and for that to really um, start to have an impact on um, on the industry and the companies that are starting to really bring forth technology in, the, in all of those spaces um, are really, uh, I think, going to ramp up in 2020. I think I, I take one company in particular, Appeal. Uh, which is creating a product that is used um, to extend the shelf life of uh, fruits and vegetables. And a product like that, and that should happen to be one company, product like that really has uh, the, the, the opportunity to change the, uh, the scope and the opportunities uh, for technology across a number of different applications and fresh produce. Uh, so I think as we see results of those products uh, in the marketplace, uh, the, the, the other countries will be more accepting, and then we'll see protocols from that that'll give um, uh, acceptance across a number of different uh, territories. Yeah, Tyler and I definitely like Appeal and what they're doing. I like their approach of hiring a lot of talent from the the produce industry to to kind of build that company out. They have a lot of good expertise on on that team to develop in, and especially with with export and long transits, ensuring you make good arrivals is is very high up the list. There's some other cool companies doing some things in in traceability with with blockchain and e and that kind of thing. So it'll be exciting to see how more companies can add value in that part of the supply chain. Richard, before we wrap up this section, can you maybe talk to us a little bit more about the projects that you're involved with, with PMA? Um, I know you have some Fresh Connections events and the Global Development Committee that uh, that we met on several years back in Columbia, but maybe just kind of give us um, a view of what you have in store for, tw- for 2020. Yeah, Tim, we did meet, uh, I think, uh, for one of the first times when you came on board uh, the PMA's Global Development Committee, and that is a group of uh, industry leaders from across the fresh produce uh, industry uh, and from around the world that really focus on helping us understand what are those trends, what are those key issues that are emerging in different parts of the world, and then how should PMA be responding to them or providing tools to our members to adjust to those different um, technologies. So um, the Global Development Committee has an annual meeting, and the next meeting will take place in um, Spain in, in early March. Uh, so that's one of the key events that are coming up. Uh, we do have on the books um, Fresh Connections, which are really many versions of PMA's Fresh Summit that will take place in Mexico, um, South Africa, Brazil, Chile, um, and possibly China in 2020. And then for us, a new uh, smaller event will take place in um, Singapore Uh, in March as well. So uh, another busy year for us globally for PMA. uh, And of course, a number of events in the United States taking place. uh, The signature event being Fresh Summit, which will occur for the first time in Dallas, Texas, um, for the in the middle of October in 2020. Richard, thanks so much for for your take on everything. It's been great to have your insight on on this big topic that is trade. Um, I learned a ton just in our in our short conversation. But let's move to the section we call quick takes as we finish things up. What's your favorite business book and why? Um, so I, I would say my favorite, not necessarily book, but publication is the Harvard Business Review, and I think I enjoy that one. Uh, because it covers a lot of different topics um, and has a real global bent for for me. If I look at a, one of my favorite books uh, that I've read lately is a book called Clashing Over Commerce. It's really a history of U.S. trade policy. It's not an, it's not an easy read. It's about 800 pages. But I found that for anybody who's interested in knowing what the real background on trade policy is and, and how it's shaped um, the commerce within the United States and even outside the borders, it's not a bad read, even if it does take some time to get through it. What's something you've changed your mind about recently? 
Um, I have a 16-year-old uh, son, and so one of the things I've changed my mind about recently is uh, the expectation that um, things move at my own time and pace. Uh, I've learned uh, that um, teenagers have their own mind and their own spirits, and they do things as they want to do them. And I've come to the realization that that's okay. Just because dad wouldn't do it a certain way uh, doesn't mean it's the, uh, the wrong way. It just means it's a different way. Richard, what are you spending too much money on right now? Probably on um, uh, self-help books and um, trying to f get into other people's minds about how they solve problems and putting them down in books. And I think uh, uh, one of my goals in 2020 is to basically stop buying and finish reading the ones that I already have. I like that. What are you not spending enough on? Uh Probably not spending enough time on uh, 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 fun vacations. I spend a lot of time traveling for work, and occasionally I will stay um, after or go early for some uh, holiday time. But I think what I want to do and spend more time and more, obviously in turn, more money is uh, more enjoyable travel time um, so that I can truly experience the people in the places that I go to and not just uh, show up on a plane and then turn around on a few days later and, uh, and leave the country. Too much of the world to see. Besides what we've maybe already hit on, what issue or trend do you find most compelling in food and agriculture today? Um, I think one of the most interesting trends uh, in food and agriculture is the trend of involving other peripheral industries around agriculture to get involved and in turn uh, attract young people to the industry. And the example I would give is uh, if you had take investments in the past, companies that were interested in investing in agriculture were more hardcore production related. And now you have companies like Google and Amazon and um, other companies like that who have technology that they want to apply to fresh produce or the broader agriculture industry. And I think when you see that happen, you've got a whole new group of um, university students who see opportunities in food and agriculture that wouldn't have existed in the past. And so I think that brings a whole new different group of people to agriculture to experience what I've been able to experience over my career um, and do it without having to, um, in some degree, be burdened by the legacy of traditional agriculture that someone like I have. And so those new ideas come in fresh uh, and they may challenge us in ways that we couldn't have expected or couldn't have predicted a few years ago. Richard, what app or technology tools can't you live without? Uh, app wise, I would have to say probably WhatsApp, uh, which is the, the messenger service that I found is used just about all over the world. And you get into places like South Africa and Central and South America and Australia and Southeast Asia, it is the app that everybody's on. It's not used in China. Uh, WeChat is the platform of choice there. But I found that WhatsApp is just a great way to stay in touch with people all over the world. And it's one of those uh, programs I probably just couldn't do without. That makes a ton of sense, given, <laughs> given your role. Can you tell us about any interests you have outside of your work with PMA? Um, I... I'm interested in uh, exercise. I try as I as I move through the years. I try to um, uh, do as much outdoors as I can. I, uh, like I mentioned at the first of the program, I grew up in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Southwest Virginia, and so I try to spend as much time hiking uh, and camping as I can. And as my um, 16 year old 16 year old son is um, kind of getting to that stage where he should be outdoors more, that's becoming more and more of an opportunity for us to do things together. So um, I think uh, being outside in nature, uh, particularly hiking and camping is something I really enjoy. Richard, thanks so much for being on the show. We really appreciate it. As we wrap up here, how can listeners get in, get in touch and connect with you? Probably one of the best ways is um, uh, to find me on WhatsApp, but the most direct way is probably by email, and that is rowen at pma.com. It's probably the simplest way to track me down. Awesome. Thanks so much for being on the show, Richard. Great. Thanks, Tim and Tyler, and I wish both of you a, a, a very happy uh, new year and all the success for uh, best of success for 2020. 
So, Tim, what'd you think? I thought it was a really good episode with Richard. It's fun having him on the on the podcast. I've known him for several years, and he just brings such a good perspective um, on trade and what's happening in the industry. So hopefully that was that was really helpful for our listeners, especially those ones that are involved in international aspects of their business. Yeah, definitely a great way to end the year for sure, talking about that. Well, guys, uh, once again, be sure to check out our social media. Go go, give us a follow and see the updated social media logo. Hope you guys enjoy it. And then be sure to sign up for Acre Insights um, to get our newsletter that comes out every few weeks. And I think with that, we're, we're ending 2019, Tim. I know. Another great year. Looking forward to 2020. All right. Thanks for listening, guys. 